Hey everybody, my name is Chris Guthridge. I'm a podcaster and broadcaster over at 4playernetwork.com, and these are my top 10 games of 2013. The Fulbright Company's Gone Home may seem like an odd candidate for Game of the Year discussions, but I think it deserves as much consideration as any other hit from 2013. Sure, its gameplay seems thin on the surface, but the real triumph here is in atmospheric storytelling. As you wander through the house that serves as the game's setting, you piece together a web of stories as nuanced as the family members who have lived them. There isn't much to do in the game other than look and listen, but the action takes place in the player's mind, synthesizing seemingly random progressions of notes and letters and clues into a touching tale of love and loss. Gone Home came right out of left field and bowled me over, not just with its enveloping narrative method, but also with its heart and sincerity. Thanks to developer Simogo, I'll always think twice before writing off mobile games from now on. Such was the impact that Supernatural puzzler Yearwalk had on me. Everything about this game, from the art and sound design to the story, is touched with a bewildering meld of whimsy and dread that haunted me in a way that is rare for any game, let alone an iOS game. The real kicker in the experience here is the ingenious way the game itself ties into its companion app, twisting the narrative into an awesome metagame experience. Your Walk wasn't a particularly long game, but the amount of suspense and intrigue it managed to evoke for me in that short time has earned it a spot on my list. As a fan of classic science fiction stories, Facepalm's games The Swapper hit all the right notes for me. The game revolves around a mysterious device with the ability to instantly clone its user as well as swap his or her consciousness between said clones. In keeping with the spirit of high science fiction, the tale uses this strange technology to reflect on subjects of existentialism and the nature of consciousness. But it isn't just the atmosphere or story that make this game stand out, it's the gameplay. Using the swapper device to achieve your goal is a mind-bending challenge. The impressive thing about the Swapper's design is its sense of progression. You never earn any new upgrades or equipment per se, however the game is constantly teaching you new techniques, new ways to think with the Swapper device. I would be lying if I said I never got frustrated with this game, but the sense of victory that comes with drawing on your full faculties of spatial reasoning to complete a particularly difficult puzzle is near euphoric. Fire Emblem Awakening represents another big surprise for me for a couple of reasons. Not only is it a 3DS game, it's also a Japanese tactics RPG. Two types of games that, until recently, I never would have played. And yet not only did I play this one, I liked it so much I gave it the number 7 slot on my list. Fire Emblem accomplishes adding something that I'm not used to seeing in a tactics game. Emotion. Most of my experiences with these sorts of games revolve around using hard, logical tactics to lead a force of faceless soldiers to victory. Sacrifices are made, countless soldiers die without so much as a name. But that all changes here with Fire Emblem Awakening. Here, each of your soldiers have names, faces, likes, dislikes, hopes, dreams. They're people with histories and pasts, fighting for their future. For me, that changed everything. Furthering my involvement was the game's relationship system, which allows your troops to form bonds amongst themselves and even marry and have children. Splash in a bit of time travel and those children can become new soldiers for you, each of them unique in their own right while still displaying traits of their parents. I'm ranking Fire Emblem not just for being a great game, but also for broadening my horizons to handheld games as a whole. There's something about Underdog Brothers, clever puzzle gameplay, and ghost busting that really seems to resonate with me. It seems Luigi's Mansion Dark Moon was destined to be on my list from the moment I got my hands on it. 
If the original Luigi's Mansion posited that Mario's green-clad brother could be leading man material in his own right, Dark Moon puts the issue well and truly to bed. This game was fun from the get-go, yet it never seemed to run out of new puzzles, new enemies, new experiences to dish out, and for that I love it. Each mansion seemed very different from its counterparts, keeping this game from falling into the trap of its predecessor of stagnating before its conclusion. I would be remiss if I didn't include an obligatory Ghostbusters reference here, so I'll just say that Luigi's Mansion Dark Moon was an apt reminder that Bustin' does indeed make me feel good. Cellar Door Games styles their wildly entertaining rogue legacy as a genealogical rogue light. But make no mistake, this game is no walk in the park. The real story here is the interesting way in which Rogue Legacy iterates on the popular roguelike genre. While death is indeed permanent, the game maintains a sense of continuity between playthroughs with its genealogy system, whereby each time you play, you choose a descendant of your last character. This becomes particularly interesting when you take character attributes into account. Characters can have conditions ranging from vertigo, to colorblindness, or gigantism, to irritable bowel syndrome, most of which affect gameplay in one way or another. On the surface, playing this game can seem like a real grind, but unlike most grinding experiences I'm accustomed to, this game never wears thin. I must have lost over 100 characters by now with no more than one dead boss out of five to show for it, and yet I keep coming back. Every death is a chance to find something new or to progress in some way, and the experience never tires. Rogue Legacy earns a spot here on my list for taking grinding, something I loathe, and actually making it fun. Clay Entertainment really hit the nail on the head when they came up with the title for their roguelike wilderness survival game. Don't Starve has a sort of Lovecraftian, whimsically macabre style that's become quite popular these days, yet executes it with a level of charm that is rare. Don't Starve is a game simply about that, not starving to death. How you accomplish this increasingly abstract goal of not dying is up to you, but the game arms you with an increasingly eccentric bevy of tools both scientific and mystical. But starvation isn't the only fate you'll attempt to avoid. Players can be felled by all manners of bizarre creatures or even unknown dangers lurking in the darkness of each and every night. And, in true Lovecraftian fashion, players can even go insane, finding themselves beset upon by shambling horrors and abominations. My love for Don't Starve's design and character and the inherently unforgiving nature of the worlds it concocts ensures that it will be the sort of game I find myself going back to over and over again for years to come. Saints Row 4 may not have been the superhero game we deserved, but it was certainly the superhero game we needed, especially after the supreme disappointment that was this year's Batman Arkham Origins. After Saints Row the Third, I was certain I'd seen all this series had to offer. Thankfully, I was incredibly wrong. This game turned a series that was already up at 11 to 12, then broke the goddamn knob off. Is it the prettiest game to come out this year? No. Does the story make much sense at all? Not really. Did any of this mitigate my enjoyment of the game? Absolutely not. Saints Row 4 gets number 3 on my list just for the stupid smile I was wearing on my face the whole time I was playing it. Don't think Saints Row's absurdity for the sake of absurdity style is your thing? Well, give it a try anyway. You may be pleasantly surprised. I'm sure this one comes as a little surprise. If The Last of Us was a movie, it would most certainly be Oscar bait. As a game, it's definitely... what? Game of the Year bait? Well, whatever you call it, this game is simply gorgeous. Graphic, story, acting, gameplay, this game nails it all. If you own a PlayStation 3 and you haven't even tried this game, you've made a huge mistake. But the single player game about Joel and Ellie has enough people jumping to champion its cause, so I won't retread worn territory there. But the real surprise here is the multiplayer mode, called Factions. How could a competitive multiplayer mode seemingly tacked on to a AAA game be anything but bad? How still could said multiplayer not only not be bad, but instead be amazing? I don't have these answers, but understand this. 
Last of Us multiplayer is supremely awesome. Do yourself a favor, get some friends and some headsets, and take it for a spin. Almost done. Keep the pressure on. And so it was that 2013 would forever be known as the year that I named a Wii U exclusive as my number one game of the year. I really don't even know what to think about that. But what I do know is that the Wonderful 101 from Platinum Games was the most fun, the most charming, the most exciting, the most endearing game I played this year. At first look, it may not seem like much, but don't let that fool you. I watched snippets of gameplay for months without a second thought. It was just another cutesy little Nintendo exclusive, I thought. And yet, when I finally had a chance to put my hands on it, my whole perspective shifted. The gameplay in Wonderful 101 is unlike anything else. If I had to describe it, I would throw out titles like Pikmin and Bayonetta. And while those games aptly describe certain aspects of the Wonderful 101, nothing I could say would ever truly do this game justice. Everything about this game just screams awesome, super cool, fun time, blasty blast. Flashy superheroes, incredibly witty writing, super crazy action sequences, and more charm than you can shake a 10-foot pole at make the Wonderful 101 the single most purely enjoyable 20 hours of gameplay I have e experienced all year. And there you have it. Those are my top 10 games for 2013. This has been a really great year for gaming, especially for me since I've finally been able to play some PC games, play some handheld games, even a couple iOS games here or there. I was really able to broaden my horizons of the typical kind of games I'd normally play, so this was a great year for me, and I, I can only hope that 2014 is going to be even better than this one. Thanks for watching, guys, and we'll catch you later.